Let us begin now in prayer. Lord, we just want to thank you right now for this day that you have made, that you watched over us. We all made it here safely. We want to be thankful that we can even be able to meet here openly like this. And the freedom we've had in this land now for over 200 years, the freedom of religion. Many people have come from many different countries, from Europe to get away from the state church, and from communist countries and many other countries to be able to come here and worship freely. And we have loved ones that have served in the military, and there are many persons who have given their lives over the years for this freedom. And we want to be thankful, and we want to thank you, Lord, for the freedom that you've given to us and the blessings on this country because of the foundation of the Judeo-Christian ethic. And we just want to thank you that we can just praise you and worship you this day. I pray, Lord, even though we would face the realities of what is going on, that you would give us the joy of the Lord and the peace that passes all understanding and comfort us in your word, Lord, and by your spirit today. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this being the Memorial Day weekend here in the U.S., um, Melinda and I live down in San Diego, so what we like to do on Monday is uh, we'll go down to Fort Rosecrans uh, at the National Cemetery, and it's just right next to uh, the uh, air station there at North Island, and uh, she was very fortunate to be able to have the ashes of her mom interned there, and not because her mom served, but because her dad had served in the military and the army uh, right after World War II in Germany. So because of that, uh, she was able to have her ashes there. And so we will normally go down there because they'll have ceremonies uh, that will be going on and honoring the, the men and women that have died. Uh, and then we would like to put also flowers on her mom's grave. Well, just two weeks ago, Israel had their Memorial Day on May 12th. And then two days after that, on May 14th, was the 76th Independence Day celebration. On May 14, 1948, 76 years ago, Israel became a nation in just one day in fulfillment of Isaiah 66, verse 8. As soon as Zion travailed, she also brought forth her sons. And normally this would be a joyous celebration, but this year it was a much more somber situation. And the nation of Israel right now has a broken heart. They're broken hearted. Uh, you can think of it in terms that we would say here in the United States of America as PTSD, or they've been severely traumatized. And this is as a nation, and it's not only because of what happened to them on October 7th, but what happened afterwards with tens of thousands of people all over the world coming out into the streets to support those that were attempting to commit genocide against them. But not only that, but that the whole world cries out, and even the world court that is trying to say that the leaders of Israel are war criminals and that Israel itself is committing genocide. Now, in Hitler's propaganda... It was said, you don't want to tell just a little lie or just an average size lie. You want to tell the absolutely biggest lie you can think of and just repeat it over and over and over again. And then, for the people, it will become truth. And this is what we have witnessed right before our very eyes. A nation that has had genocide attempted against them over and over and over through the hundreds and hundreds of years since they were taken out of the land at the time of World War II, and then most recently on October 7th by Hamas. And their goal is genocide. But yet we're we're told, supposedly, that Israel is committing genocide against the Gazan citizens. What could be a bigger lie? But they're God's people, And you need to be careful when you touch them because you touch the eye of the God of Israel. In this last week, 
Several of the leaders of Iran crashed in a helicopter and were killed. And justice was brought about by the God of Israel. They're at the very top. They're behind all of this and all of the different countries around them that are firing missiles into that country right now. It's not a Gaza war, you guys. It's Gaza, Yemen, it's Hezbollah in Lebanon, it's Syria, it's Iraq, and even Iran itself has fired missiles into Israel. They are fighting a war for survival against Iran. And what has Iran said over and over and over again over the years? We will destroy that illegitimate Zionist entity. So they hate Israel for being Zionist. And so I would like to discuss today about Zionism. God is able to use those nations and people that are in rebellion against him for his purposes and to accomplish his will. For example, at the time of King Nebuchadnezzar, now we see, I think it's around the fourth chapter, that actually God's judgment came upon him and then he came to know the Lord. But he was a godless king before that. And even though that was so, God used him to bring judgment onto his own people, Judah. And then there's the the king of Persia, Cyrus. He was used by God to bring his people back into the land after their captivity. So that's in the 45th chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 to 4. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him, And to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. That was fulfilled in history as they came in and conquered Babylon. In verse 3, I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. And this was a long time before he was ever born. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I have also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. So we can see here, that God can use those that don't even know him to accomplish his purposes and to work for his will, even though that's not necessarily what they themselves intend. And I'd like to also turn to John chapter 11, verse 49. John chapter 11, verse 49. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people, and that the whole nation not perish. Now he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. Now Jesus Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead, and they even wanted to kill Lazarus and get rid of him because of that evidence of the power of God, and they wanted to get rid of Jesus. And it says that Caiaphas actually prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And so, even though this is an evil and wicked man that was against the God of Israel and wanted to destroy Jesus, God still used him in this situation to prophesy. Now, if you think about what happened with the situation, when Jezebel was very angry with Elijah because he had uh, proven who the one true God is, and he had killed the prophets, the false prophets, And Jezebel said, 
that by tomorrow, you're going to be just like them. You're toast. I'm going to kill you. So Elijah fled out to the brook to get away from Queen Jezebel. And in that situation, God used ravens, unclean birds, to sustain him, to save his life at that moment in time. And I believe that shows to us that even these days that we live in, and and we don't know how many years we have, we might find ourselves in situations in which people who do not even know the Lord may help us in such a way so as to be able to survive until the time that we're snatched out of here. There was a couple times when Lynn and I were down and out or just in difficult situations, and God used actually unsaved people in our life to help us out. And we are always amazed to this day, but it reminds us of that, that the Lord can use unsaved people. I think about, she was 19, and I was 21, and we were getting married. And uh, we didn't really realize what we were getting ourselves into. We were going to stay at her parents' house, but a couple months later, it didn't work out, and we were moving out. And we had lived at home and never been out on our own. And her dad came with us and helped us to get the phone and helped us to get set up. And uh, I had one car and she didn't have one, so he said, I'll, I'll lend you my car. And uh, all the years, he let me talk to him over and over and over and over again uh, about Jesus, about the Word of God. But unfortunately, he never came to know the Lord. And then later on, several years later, in my late 20s, when I was at work, we were going through a difficult time, and there's a guy at my workplace called Ken Benefield. And for whatever reason, he just took an interest, and uh, I gave him a ride to work, and he's asking me, uh, how come you and Lynn are under such difficult circumstances, yet you're able to be still married? Because his marriage had come apart, and it was a very ugly situation he'd gone through. So I was able to tell him that it wasn't because we're just so absolutely awesome, but actually it's because of the Lord that he brought us through these things, and we're still together. Um, but he never came to know the Lord. But he wanted to show his gratitude, he was a handyman. He was very handy and came over and uh, fixed things for us and helped us out. So see, the Lord can help us even through the unclean ravens, even th- through persons in our lives that don't know him. And God said that when he is to regather his people that were scattered throughout the whole earth and bring them back into the land, that they would be brought back in unbelief. And also, several months ago, we saw in Ezekiel chapter 36 that the Lord clearly says that I'm not doing this for your sake. My name has been profaned. I'm doing it for my name's sake. And also, he is a God that never lies, and he never breaks his promise. So he made it very clear why he was going to be doing this. And we've seen this happening over the last 100 years actually more than 100 years, and they call that Zionism. Now, the modern political definition of Zionism would be a nationalist movement that emerged in Europe in the late 1800s with the goal to establish a Jewish homeland in the ancient land of Israel. And I'd like to mention right now, just briefly, three key Zionists that the Lord used in the creation of the modern state of Israel. And the first one would be Eliezer ben Yehuda. And he was born in Belarus in Eastern Europe. His native language was Yiddish. And at an early age, he had already learned several languages. And God gave him the gift of languages. I know about Jacob. I know others. Personally, I knew this guy was a believer that came from Egypt, and he knew several languages fluently. And it absolutely amazes me because I know one language, English. That's it. So when I see someone like that, I know, wow, that is awesome. And we see in the Bible that God gave tremendous gifts when Solomon asked because he felt so inadequate to be able to rule over God's people that he asked for wisdom and understanding and that God gave that to him abundantly, and he had greater wisdom than anyone who ever lived on this earth other than Jesus himself. And so God will give the gifts to people. And you know what? If you look at 
at someone like, say, well, maybe Eddie Van Halen, because that's when I grew up. And they could be people that don't know the Lord, but they have absolutely awesome gifts. And the gifts that everybody has came from the Lord, whether they use them to his glory or for themselves or to get rich or whatever. All the good things and the gifts come from God. And God can use those in the life of a person that doesn't even know him. Now, when he was 12, he had a vision where he saw light flashing across the sky with the message, the land and the language. And he took this to be God's calling on his life to immigrate to the land and dedicate his life to the restoration of the Hebrew language. So in 1881, Ben-Yehuda immigrated to the land of Israel. He set out to develop a new language because it's modern Hebrew and it's different than the ancient Hebrew. So he wanted to develop a new language that could replace Yiddish and other regional dialects as a means of everyday communication between the Jews who had moved into the land of Israel and also those who were native-born. Because you've got to realize, <laughs> the Jewish people are coming from dozens and dozens of countries from all over the world. They all speak different languages. So how are you going to possibly be able to have a restored nation without that nation having a language, without those persons being able to communicate with each other. So he had someone that was a very, very dedicated wife, that when she married him, she already knew this, and she completely and totally dedicated her life also to this pur purpose and to supporting him in his work. So he and his wife had agreed to raise their son entirely in Hebrew. They did not allow him to be exposed to any other languages during childhood, and they also did this with their other children. Then sometime later, there was several other couples that agreed to do this as well. But there were those that considered them to be too extreme for keeping their children isolated because they had to keep them in their home because other Jewish people were speaking many other different languages. And Eliezer ben Yehuda himself spoke different languages, and so did his wife. So they never spoke anything to them but Hebrew. And there were persons that thought that they were being very extreme, and that this was like uh, child abuse, you know. And so they actually had much opposition against them because of this, and there were those that you could say ratted on them, but not really. They accused them of doing things they weren't doing, that they were um, trying to stir up rebellion against the Turkish Empire at that time, and so he actually did spend some time in jail because of these false accusations. Now, the Yiddish is a language that is a mixture of both Hebrew and German words. So think about that. It is still Hebrew in a way. It's some Hebrew, but it's an uh, impure language. Keep that in mind for later. The Hebrew that existed for the previous 1900 years was strictly a sacred language and was used only for the purpose of worship. And the rabbis wanted to keep it that way. They felt it was sacrilege and doing something against God if you didn't keep Hebrew as a sacred language only, that you were desecrating it. So they did not support him. They were very much against him in his efforts at what he was trying to do. Now, he was the initiator of the first modern Hebrew dictionary known as the Ben Yehuda Dictionary, and he had suffered tuberculosis from childhood. This gave him a tremendous commitment to his work because he never knew how many days he had left of his life. And he would work 19 hours a day because he was very determined to accomplish this. And day by day, he didn't know if it was going to be his last day. Now, the ironic thing is, is his wife married him knowing that she would be exposed and she was exposed, and then she actually passed away when he was still alive. But when she was on her deathbed, she contacted her younger sister and asked her, would you please marry my husband and help him to continue his work as long as he is still here on this earth? And she consented to that. So her younger sister, after her death, married him and committed the rest of her life with him to accomplish this task he had committed his life to. 
So it was a tremendous human effort to accomplish this task. But at the same time, though, it's a miracle. And a lot of times we will think about a miracle from God has to be absolutely 100% supernatural. So things are either supernatural or natural, one or the other. But that's not the case. A lot of times God will do something supernatural and you might not even realize it at first. You know, it may appear to be very natural. And many people have fought in the wars since the time Israel first came into existence. And later on, they thought back and realized that was the hand of God. He saved our lives. And it it was supernatural, even though at the time they didn't really realize it. And also, it was the work of God and a fulfillment of prophecy. The Lord had said that when his people returned to the land a pure language would be restored. And that's in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. Now there was another very important individual that was a Zionist, and that was David Ben-Gurion. In 1906, David Ben-Gurion immigrated to the land of Israel, and he dedicated his life to serving the Zionist movement in the land of Israel, and he continued to work to bring Jews to settle in the British-controlled territory. Now, in World War I, there was a Jewish man that had developed TNT. They were, uh, the British were running out of gunpowder, and they were in a very critical situation and could possibly lose the war. And he came through in that situation, so they had promised to make it possible for the Jewish people to come back into the land and have their homeland. Unfortunately, at the end of uh, the war the British people changed their mind and then favored uh, the Arab people for various economic reasons. And so he had to work in a very um, clever way with wisdom and understanding on how to try and get Jewish people into the land, even though the British were strictly restricting that, even to the point of putting them into what would look like a concentration camp on Cyprus after World War II, They would capture the ships trying to get to Israel and put them onto the island of Cyprus trying to prevent them from getting into the Holy Land. But you know what? At that time, the British Empire in which the sun never sets was taken away from them by the God of Israel for what they were doing to his people after what they had suffered in World War II and breaking their promise and preventing them from coming back into the Holy Land. Ben-Gurion played an instrumental role in establishing the state of Israel. He both drafted and was the first to sign Israel's Declaration of Independence. Although it is not Israel's constitution, it is a document that establishes their form of government, and it is a, a, a guideline or an authority that they look to when there's disputes um, concerning matters of the government. He is known as a founding father of Israel and became the first prime minister He is a political giant in Israel's history and a legend similar to what George Washington would be to us, how we would look at George Washington as our founding father and also a a general that fought in the the war that brought about uh, the creation of the United States of America. He played a significant role in forming the IDF by serving as defense minister for many years. Ben-Gurion's leadership came at a critical time in the nation's history, and his commitment to the Zionist cause from its early beginnings made him the ideal person to unite the various Zionist groups, actually preventing civil war. At the birth of the nation, there was a real threat of civil war because of the conflict between two organizations, the Irgun and Haganah. He helped to establish a very important balance in the government, As part of the agreement, he committed to establishing a non-theocratic state, but one that would respect many core Jewish practices, such as Sabbath observance, kosher kitchens and government-funded institutions, and allowance for rabbinic schools to be considered equal to secular state schools. Now, what just happened recently, in the last year or so, Um, partly because the United States is in a weak position right now, but also because there was really serious fighting going on 
and controversy within the state of Israel um, because at this time I'm talking about right here, they reached agreements and they made an allowance for about like 700 young men who were in yeshiva to not have to serve military service. But as the years went by, it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew. And it became a, a very sore issue that just like festered and got worse and got worse because now it's hundreds, now it's thousands, now it's tens of thousands. And there's tens of thousands of young men that will go straight into yeshiva and do not serve in the IDF where everyone else in that country, as soon as they get out of high school, both male and female, must go directly into the IDF. And then also, the Supreme Court was slowly getting more and more and more power, kind of like what we see ha- happening here in the United States of America. And the Knesset, which is their parliament, would pass certain laws, and the Supreme Court would just overturn them and say, nah, we, we don't allow that. So those two things, mostly, that were causing a great big controversy that was going on. And because of that, Hamas and most of all Iran believe, okay, this is the time to strike right now. They're, they're, they're weak, they're divided. There was even persons in the IDF and in the Air Force that were saying that if w- war breaks out, we're, we're not going to report to duty. Because you've got to realize it's a, it's a citizen army. They all go in there out of high school, but then they just go in an everyday life um, and uh, have jobs and so forth. But... If a major war happens, then they're called up. And they're saying they wouldn't report. So it is actually a supernatural act of God and miracle, actually, that they all suddenly showed up. And then not only that, but Israelis and even Jewish people from all around the world got on planes from all over the world and headed for Israel in their time of need. Because Israel right now is fighting for its Survival, And if they have to, they'll go it alone. Now, it started as a socialist state in the beginning, but democratic. And over the years, it slowly morphed into a free market economy. Now, the third person I'd like to speak of is Golda Meir. She became a committed Zionist from the time of uh, being a child with no influence from any adult or anybody else. She was a child growing up in the Ukraine. Ukraine's in the news right now. It was part of the Russian Empire at that time, and she experienced persecution by the programs that they would have. And at that time, she made up her mind, someday when I am able to, I will immigrate to the land of Israel. Her family was able to get out of there and to immigrate to the U.S. in 1906. She grew up in Milwaukee, the United States of America, graduated from high school, and became a teacher And then in 1921, she and her husband were able to immigrate to the land of Israel. Now, at first, she served in a settlement, which was at that time called a kibbutz. And she put her heart and her effort 100% into that. And she had great talent in agriculture. So they noticed that there, and they sent her uh, to go to schools for agriculture. And then after a few years, they sent her to be a representative in the government and to serve in the government. And she was one of the individuals, many years later, that signed the Israeli Declaration of Independence in 1948. And then she became the fourth prime minister of Israel. Now, back in the 70s, they made a movie that my wife really uh, liked about Golda, my ear. And it was about her whole life. And so, uh, just back in September... There was another another movie that was coming out. It was called Golda. And we thought, well, I don't really want to see that because what they showed for the previews are saying, I look really dark and and, and, and dreary and depressing. And actually, actually it was. But we were were over at a a shopping area, and it was playing there. So we changed our minds. We said, okay, well, let's go see this. There was Golda, the movie. And it came out in September. So we went to go and see that. And the strange thing to me was, I don't think it's any coincidence, but the movie itself was all based upon what happened during the Yom Kippur War. So just like if you ever saw that movie about, uh, I think it's 13, 13 Days in October, uh, about JFK and the, missile, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was just about those 13 days. Well, this movie was kind of like that. It was showing day by day by day what they went through in that war, and it was only a matter of days. So that's the way they made the movie. 
But just a few weeks later, the attack happened on October 8th. History repeats itself. The same sort of thing happened again, and in the same month. And it happened for the same reason, because of an intelligence failure. Now, you don't think that God didn't know about that? What happened was absolutely horrible. But Melinda and I were very fortunate this morning to see someone who just came back from Israel, and she was able to share about what God is actually doing behind the scenes. Then they turned off the cameras. It was no longer, no longer on YouTube because she was going to talk about things that she can't dis- discuss pu- publicly, so I can't tell you what those things were. But Moon and I were greatly heartened this morning to see that. Now, the Yom Kippur War started with a surprise attack in October of 1973. And this war was the closest that Israel came to being completely destroyed as a nation. And Golda was the prime minister at that time and had to deal with, humanly speaking, an absolutely impossible situation. And you can kind of look at what they're dealing with now. It's kind of like that also. As Ben-Gurion was, similar to George Washington, what he is to us in the United States, so Golda, in a way, is similar to what Abraham Lincoln is to us. She was there to help preserve Israel in the time of Israel's possible destruction. Now, that's political modern Zionism. I would like to now look at what is Zionism in the Bible. So first I'd like to refer to Psalm 137, 1-3. This has always been a favorite of mine for many years. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung our harps. For there our captors demanded of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. That was the situation in which they were being led away captive into Babylon when the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed, and they were taunting them and making them miserable within that circumstance. There's uh, an old Jesus People Worship song that I just love to this day. And it was word for word from the old King James, that Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. For the pilgrim feast, people would come from all over the land of Israel, and then even some would come from Europe. But they would go up to Jerusalem or Zion. As they would go, they would sing the songs of ascent, such as Psalm 118 that we we sung, sung part of it today in the worship about how Jesus was rejected as a cornerstone. And through that, God used that to bring salvation. Now, Zion was considered to be the high point of all the land of Israel. So whenever you were in the land of Israel, when you were headed towards Mount Zion or Jerusalem, you were considered to be going up. Now, it was announced at the United Nations Conference in the year 2000 AD in Durban, South Africa. South Africa is the one that's bringing Israel to the court right now to say they're committing genocide. That Zionism is racism. There is much misunderstanding and lies about what Zionism is. A Zionist is one who believes that the Jewish people have a right to return to their promised land of Israel. The word Zion is used over 150 times in the Bible and refers to the land of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, the children of Israel, the mountain of the Lord, the message of salvation which the Messiah of Israel will bring, the return of the Jewish people to their God-given land, and even 
refers to the eternal home of the believers, and that's in Hebrews chapter 12. Even though some have called Zionism racism, that is completely false. The word Zion is a great word, and even the Lord God of Israel is a Zionist. He is the one who roars as a lion out of Zion, which is clearly identified as the city of Jerusalem where God has put his name forever. Zion is the name given to God's people who he has engraved on the palms of his hand. And that's in Isaiah 49. In Zechariah chapter 9, it is a prophecy referring to the coming of the Messiah into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, lowly, humble, and having salvation. Zion is referring to the hope of eternal life. And we must never forget that the Redeemer comes out of Zion, bringing salvation and his reward. Now what do Israel's enemies say that Zionism is? They say Zionism is racism. Zionism is apartheid. Zionism is a Jewish conspiracy. Zionism is occupation of Arab land. But what does the Bible say? The word Zion is used over 150 times in the Bible to refer to the city of Jerusalem, the nation of Israel as a whole, to believers in the Messiah as the hope of Israel, to the hill of Ophel, the original city of David, to one of the mountains upon which Jerusalem sits, Mount Zion, and also one of the gates of the city of Jerusalem, Zion's Gate, which is on the southwest side of the city. Zion is the property on planet Earth called Jerusalem and Israel. Jerusalem is the most important city in the world and the internal, eternal capital of the nation of Israel. Psalm 48 calls Zion the city of the great king and also the city of our God. And Psalm 147, 12, Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. And in Isaiah 52, 1 says that Zion is Jerusalem, the holy city. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 14, the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. I'd like to look at Isaiah chapter 2 right now, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. The word which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem... Now, I will, now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream into it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And I'd like to look now at Isaiah chapter 33, verse 20. Look upon Zion, the city of our appointed feast. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, an undisturbed habitation, a tent which will not be folded. Its stakes will never be pulled up, nor any of its cords be torn apart. And then in Isaiah chapter 37, verse 32, For out of Jerusalem will go forth a remnant, and out of Mount Zion survivors, the zeal of of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Zion refers to the land of Israel. We see in Joel chapter 2, 
Joel chapter 2, 1, verse 1 and verse 15. At verse 1, Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. And then on verse 15, Blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly. Now, Zion is also the people that have been graven on the hands of the Lord. That is in Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 13 to 16. Shout for joy, O heavens, and rejoice, O earth. Break forth into joyful shouting, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on her son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. And then in Isaiah 62, verses 11 to 12. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, Lo, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called sought out, the city of not forsaken. And then in Joel again, in verse chapter 2, Joel chapter 2, verse 23. So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured down for you the rain, the early and the latter rain, as before. And in Psalm 149, verse 2, Let Israel be glad in his Maker. Let Zion rejoice in their King. So you can see it's not only Jerusalem, it's not only Mount Zion, it's not only the land of Israel, it is also referring to the people of that land, the people of Israel. Now, Zionism is the plan of God to return his people to the land of Israel. That's Isaiah 43, verse 5 to 7. Isaiah 43, verse 5 to 7. I thank you all for having very much patience with me. I don't think I've ever read so many different verses in different places in the Bible. (laughs) Isaiah 43, 5 to 7. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. See, it's all over the entire earth. Everyone who is called by my name, and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. So God is a Zionist, and he is doing this, and he's doing this in our day. And I believe through everything that's going on, an explosion of anti-Semitism, that this will continue to happen more, that Jewish people will not feel safe throughout the world, and will be making Aliyah to the land of Israel. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 11.
So the ransom of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion. And everlasting joy will be on their heads. They will obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. So they're experiencing much sorrow now, but someday it will flee away. And in Isaiah chapter 51, that's 51 verse 11. Now, Zion is also the place where the Lord dwells. We see that in Psalm 911. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare among the peoples his deeds. And then in Psalm 76, verses 1 to 2, God is known in Judah. His name is great in Israel. His tabernacle is in Salem, his dwelling place also in Zion. And then in Psalm 135, 21, Blessed be the Lord from Zion, who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. And then in Joel, chapter 3, Joel chapter 3, 16 to 17. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice, voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth tremble. But the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy and strangers will pass through it no more. And Zionism is a proclamation of good tidings that announces the coming of the Lord God of Israel. And that's in Isaiah 49 to 11. Isaiah 40, verse 9. Get yourselves up on, on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will greatly lead the nursing ewes. Isaiah 46.13 says, And I will grant salvation in Zion and my glory for Israel. And in Isaiah 62.11, Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, Say to the daughter of Zion, Lo, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense with him. And in Joel 2.32, And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. And then in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then I'd like to conclude, this is especially applicable to us, in the 12th chapter of Hebrews at verse 22. So Hebrews 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks 
better than the blood of Abel. So, Zion, the new Jerusalem, will come down out of heaven. And after we have been here on this earth for 1,000 years in the millennial kingdom with the Lord Jesus, we will then live in this Zion for all eternity with Jesus ruling on his throne for all eternity. Satan will be bound. And that's where it says there will be no more tears, no more crying, and no more suffering. God's will, perfect will, will be done. And that is a joyous day. Even so, Lord, come quickly. Lord, we thank you for your sure word. We thank you for your truth. Strengthen us and help us to speak the truth in these days of such awesome and unbelievable lies that even people in the church would be deceived and believe them. And even people in the church would be against Israel and against your people. Even people in the church would go along with the immorality. These are crazy times we're living in, Lord. But you have us here for a purpose. And we're told to be in spiritual warfare and have the belt of truth and to stand up for the truth. And we're told in Second Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 2, that they were deceived because they did not have the love of the truth. Help us, Lord, to have the love of the truth. And we just want to thank you now and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.